Okay, sir, I'm starting it. Hello, mm -hmm. everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Rupakshanan, and I welcome you all to the fifth session of Yergyan webinar series organized by Banaras Sindhu University Geophysical Society uh, in collaboration with SEG BHOS Student Chapter Azerbaijan and NGRI Geophysical Society India. We have jointly conducted some very informative lectures, and you can find it on our SEG BHU YouTube channel after the conclusion of the event. In today's session, and by far the most awaited session, we have our wonderful guest, Dr. Ozi Ilmaz. Sir has a PhD in geophysics with research in exploration seismology from Stanford in the year 79. Sir is the author of some very fine books, including Seismic Data Processing, which is a must read for every student in the field. Sir has also completed his fourth book on the land seismic case studies to be published by SEG by May 21. Sir has also served as Vice President SEG and received many awards, including EAGE Conrad Slumberger Award in the year 92. Today, Sir is here to deliver his lecture on workflows for near surface modeling and subsurface imaging of complex structures. There will also be a brief Q&A session followed by a valedictory session of uh, not more than five minutes. We will also provide you a feedback form so that we can improve our upcoming lectures and to mark your attendance. So uh, do fill it. And for your prior information, the whole session is on recording so that uh, we can put it on YouTube uh, afterwards. Uh, yeah, I, so I think uh, we are good to proceed. Sir, I request you. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so today we'll present two case studies from the new book that you mentioned <clears throat> for the SEG land seismic case studies, one for the near surface and one for the subsurface. Starting with the near surface, this is the iStance workflow. It's an image-based effective medium modeling of the near surface for status corrections. <clears throat> now, you see on top a near surface velocity depth model estimated by nonlinear travel time tomography <clears throat> uh, applied to first arrival times picked from the shot gathers. And uh, from the color bar, you can see that um, you have essentially uh, a low velocity zone of the sand dunes on top and the relatively higher velocity uh, portion at the bottom. This data set is from North Africa along a line traverse from, with sand dunes. Now you can see a vertical velocity gradient associated with the uh, gradual compaction of sands over the lifespan of the sand dunes. You also see lateral velocity variations. Now note that in this model, we have two white horizons. The one on top is the floating gradient, which is a smoother version of the topography. And the one at the bottom is the intermediate datum that, is, that corresponds to the interface between the near surface with low velocities above and the subsurface with relatively higher velocities. Now we're gonna be using these two datum curves for our status corrections. In the middle, you see a near surface CVS panel, that is constant velocity stack associated uh, using a velocity that is optimum for the near surface. And note that there is indeed, let me push this to the right here. Note that <clears throat> there is indeed a very strong reflection labeled as TB, which corresponds to the uh, interface that we observe in the near surface model on top. Um, that is the uh, interface between the uh, 
near surface above and the subsurface below, which we identified as the intermediate data. We're going to make use of this um, strong reflection in the ISTATS workflow for near surface modeling. Okay, now at the bottom you see another CVS panel, uh, this time with a velocity that is optimum for the subsurface region between say 0.5 and 1.5 seconds. Now both of these CVS panels have elevation statics applied. You just move the shots and receivers from the surface topography to the floating datum using the replacement velocity, which is the average lateral average of the velocities along the intermediate datum. Now note that because we have not applied shot receiver statics to our data as yet, we have uh, severe reflection travel time and amplitude distortions in the CVS panel. So our objective is to uh, calc estimate shot receiver statics, shot receiver statics uh, using the ISTATS model that we will estimate uh, to correct for these reflection travel time and amplitude distortions. Why is it that I have a red, uh, red curve that was just plotted on my, on my, uh, on my PowerPoint? I don't know why. Anyway, so let's continue. So here's the workflow for the near surface modeling by the ISTATS method. Perform pre-stack depth migration using a range of constant velocities associated with the near surface region down to a depth that includes the surface. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir, we can. Yes. All right. So uh, let's let's uh, try to concentrate. So we perform pre-stack depth migration using a range of constant velocities associated with the region down to a depth that includes the near surface, not very deep, maybe a few hundred meters. Okay. Only the near offset of the shot gathers. 100 meters. So it's a very, very uh, fast process. So you see here one of the image panels from the PSTM volume that we obtained. Right, you, see a, you see an image panel. Sorry, you see a SIP gather. Uh, and sir, a given location. Yes? So there are some. Uh, uh, Saidu level, please switch off your mic. Muhammad, please switch off your mic. Um, can I continue? Yeah, yeah, yes, I show, sir. Okay. So, um, oh, I'm, I'm unintentionally drawing lines here. I don't know why. But on the right, you see a, a sit gather associated with this image panel at a given location marked by this vertical line. Okay. Uh, now we're going to use the SIP gather and examine the flatness of the event associated with this interface between the near surface region above and the subsurface region below. Uh, use the flatness criterion to make sure that we're picking the right uh, depth horizon with the right velocity. So I pick the depth horizon uh, represented by this pink curve and then I extract from within the image volume in depth uh, a horizon consistent semblance spectrum associated with this depth horizon. So the vertical axis in the spectrum represents the velocities with which I scan the near surface. And I pick a velocity strand from this horizon consistent 
semblance spectrum, which represent the velocities average from the floating datum down to the horizon that I just picked. And I assign that velocity strand to the near surface region as you see here. Now the extension of this velocity field down to the subsurface region is of no Doctor Iftika, no. please please switch off the mic. Uh, Bamde no. Tripathi, please uh, switch off the mic. So we have the we have the near surface model on top uh, based on the image associated with the uh, reflection from the base of the near surface region. Now, <clears throat> I can revise that depth horizon that I picked earlier based on the constant velocity image panels by performing pristine depth migration, this time using that near surface velocity depth model that I just estimated and repick that depth horizon and insert it into my velocity depth model that I estimated earlier. So you see on top, the near surface effective medium model. In the middle, you see the near surface model that I estimated from travel time tomography earlier. Comparing the two, note that the model in the middle estimated from travel time tomography actually represents, represents the physical appearance of sand dunes sand dunes, whereas the uh, model on top has no relevance to the physical characteristics of the sand dunes. It just has no physical uh, appearance. So why did I estimate that model? Well, what is the objective in estimating a model for the near surface? The prime objective is to calculate the shot receiver statics. So you take the shot receivers from the topography down to the intermediate datum using surface velocities that you estimated, say in this case, tomography model. And then you move the shots and receivers back from the intermediate datum up to the floating datum using the replacement velocity. But this uh, shift, uh, down and up is in the vertical direction because that is the underlying assumption of status corrections. <clears throat> and the only time that this is valid is when you have low velocities in the near surface. You don't have low velocities in the near surface. You don't have vertical incidence. As such, status corrections will not be valid. Microphone is off, sir. Microphone is off. On. Yes, sir. Yes. yes, sir. Okay. So, down at the bottom, you see the shot receiver static solutions from the two models that you see above. The um, light blue green curves represent the shot receiver uh, statics calculated from the model estimated from travel time tomography in the middle. And the dark blue red curves represent the shot receiver statics from the ISTAT, ISTATS model that you see on top. And they pretty much overlap. In other words, whether you use the near surface effective medium model or the near surface TOMO model, you get the same static solution. Even though the near surface effective medium model is physically not plausible, has no meaning physically, but you get the same solution as, for the, as from the tomography model. All right, why do I call it effective medium? Because I am obtaining statics from this model that is equivalent to the statics that I obtained from the tomography model. 
So it's equivalent medium model. Um, but based on physics, it's probably better to call it effective medium model. Now, in this model, note that within the near surface, velocities are constant vertically, but laterally changing. And this is the requirement for static solutions to be acceptable, all right? Now, you might still ask the question, well, why bother with the uh, equivalent medium model if I'm getting my static solution from the tomography model? Well, tomography model requires first break picking. And in areas with complex near surface, irregular topography, first breaks can be very difficult to pick, especially for 3D data. You have to do a lot of editing and it's very time consuming. It took me a whole day to pick the first breaks, edit them, and then obtain this model in the middle from travel time tomography so that I could compute the shot receiver statics. Whereas it took me less than an hour to compute the uh, ISTATS model to calculate the uh, shot receiver statics because I didn't have to pick the first breaks. Similarly, uh, in case of FWI, full wave inversion, you have to model your shock gathers. For land data, you have to do elastic wave field modeling, which is computationally very intensive. So the ISTATS workflow circumvents all these troublesome aspects of travel time tomography and full wave inversion. Let's move on. Let's now test the static solutions on the, on the data itself. How do I advance? Yeah. CVS panel with elevation statics. You see the travel time distortions of uh, subsurface reflections. And after applying the ISTATS shot receiver statics, I have now removed all the deleterious effect of the near surface associated with the sand dunes, okay? And uh, compare this with the TOMO model, they are essentially similar except for some amplitude differences. Another example is from the Middle East where you have a high velocity anhydrite layer below and uh, just beneath the near surface where the solution collapses as a result of water infused into the anhydrite zone. As you see on top, the near surface model is pretty complex. You have lateral as well as vertical velocity variations with a very strong vertical velocity gradient. The near surface CVS panel exhibits a very strong rugged reflection labeled as TB that corresponds to the interface between the near surface region and the subsurface region in the near surface model that you see on top. So we're gonna be utilizing this strong reflection in our iStance workflow. Now, without applying any shot receiver statics, but only elevation statics, you see the subsurface CVS panel exhibits severe reflection travel time distortions. We need to correct for these by calculating shock receiver statics and applying them. So the resulting, uh, the results of the ISTATS workflow that I described earlier with the North African data, uh, we have the uh, near surface model on top, the ISTATS effective medium model, with the white horizon that corresponds to the, to the uh, reflection that we just uh, showed in the previous slide uh, that separates the near surface region from the subsurface region, this one right here. And the one in the middle is the tom tomography model. The static solutions are essentially uh, 
the same, except for a constant, nearly constant time difference between the two. Now, if you have a constant time difference, DC difference between these static solutions, don't worry about it because it, it merely implies that your intermediate datum that you have selected for the TOMO model may be either too shallow or too deep. But if these two static solutions cross each other, then you, you do have a problem. <laughs> your near surface model. Continues. So after ISTAT's uh, static solutions, we see that we have removed the spurious low relief structures in the subsurface. And the tomostatic solution is quite similar to the ISTAT solution, with the exception of a maybe vertical constant time shift, as we alluded to in the static solutions. This one is from the uh, from Western Canada, where we have glacial tilt problem. Um, you can see that there is a lateral as well as vertical velocity variations in the near surface. The uh, near surface CVS panel exhibits a very strong reflection labeled as TB that corresponds to the interface between the near surface and the subsurface in the tom tomography model on top. There's also a, an internal reflection within the near surface region, which may well be related to the velocity reversal associated with the hidden layer, as we call it, the high velocity region of the associated with the glacial tail. But we're after this strong reflection. Now, without any status corrections, you see that the subsurface CVS panel exhibits uh, strong reflection travel time distortions, uh, indicating spurious structures. So here's the ISTATS model on top, the tomography model in the middle, and the static solutions at the bottom. You can see that they agree in along the line traverse, except in the middle, where we have this glacial tail zone. You can see that there is a difference here that's not constant. That's probably because the, near, the tomography method couldn't resolve this velocity reversal. Uh, that is high velocity embedded in the low velocity near surface region. But the uh, ISTATS doesn't care about it because ISTATS simply estimates an average velocity from the floating datum down to the intermediate datum at each location along the line traverse. Here's the CVS panel with elevation statics. And after ISTATS application, we can see that we have corrected for the uh, travel time distortions uh, in the uh, subsurface region. And here we see the tomostatics uh, result. You can see that there is a slight unresolved zone here uh, that is equivalent to the incorrect statics estimated in this region right here by tomostatics. This one is from Western Siberia, where we have a salt filled karstic formation in the near surface region. And the near surface CVS panel exhibits a very strong reflection labeled as TB that corresponds to the interface between the near surface and the subsurface in the tomography model on top. This reflection is so strong that it actually gives rise to its own multiple, as you see here. Now, the subsurface CVS panel shows severe travel time distortions along these reflections uh, that we want to correct for by status corrections. So here's the, um, the uh, near surface model by travel time tomography on top and by the ISTATS workflow in the middle. And these are the static solutions. Again, the solutions are in agreement 
along the line, except in this region that is in the neighborhood of this red line. Now, this nearly constant difference is not of concern, as I said earlier. But here, it seems like one of the solutions, one of the new surface model is not, is not really correct. What happened here? I got all kinds of yellow lines drawn. Sir, uh, if you will share the presentation again, uh, all of this will go. Stop share. Yes, sir. And then share screen. Share. All right. Thank you. What happened? Share sir. screen. Yes, sir. No, sir. We can't see the screen. Well, I'm trying to, but it says host disabled participant screen sharing. You disabled me. And no, sir. Actually, I don't have the host rights. Uh, it's from the. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so here's the CVS panel with elevation statics. Um, here's the CVS panel uh, with image based iStat solution. You can see that we have corrected for all those travel time distortions going back and forth. Okay. And here's the uh, tomostatics result. You can see that in the neighborhood of this vertical red line, we have some undercorrected zone um, because the tomography, travel time tomography, couldn't handle the velocity within the near surface. So let's move down to the second workflow, down to the subsurface. This is a nice workflow for what? For circumventing velocity uncertainty in imaging in areas with irregular topography, complex near surface, and complex subsurface. Here's a pre stack time migration section from northern Iraq, <clears throat> where we have, as a result of uh, tectonism, followed by extension of tectonism, we have a very complex structural zone in the middle. Let us examine the semblance spectra and the corresponding SIP gathers from this pre time migration at two locations, A and B. At location A, we have a very nice continuous uh, stratification, but at location B, right in the middle of this complex structure. So, can we, can we, can we stop talking, please? So at uh, the two locations, note that at location A, the semblance spectrum exhibits a unique velocity trend where we can confidently pick the vertical velocity function. Whereas at location B, the semblance spectrum is very complicated. You have multi-valued semblance peaks. You wouldn't know which uh, trend you should follow to pick the vertical velocity function for the RMS velocities. Now, remember that in a very complex structural uh, zone, don't expect your velocities to increase monotonically with depth or with time, as would be the case in general. You may have velocities increasing, then decreasing, then increasing, and so on. You see, you wouldn't know which way to go. So there's the velocity uncertainty. Now, at location A, note that we have a nice sit gather where we have flat events, which indicates that this RMS velocity field that we would pick for pre stack time migration is accurate, whereas the sit gather at location B exhibits not many coherent events uh, that are flat. So we couldn't possibly use such a SIP gather for residual move out analysis to update the RMS velocities 
and rerun pre-stack time migration. So we are stuck here, okay? What do we do? Well, here's the IQ workflow to circumvent this velocity uncertainty. You start with migration volume. How do you obtain that? Perform pre-stack time migration using a range of constant velocities, time migration of the process shock genders, using a range of constant velocities and obtain this velocity volume or migration volume where the horizontal axis V represents the RMS velocities and the X represents the line traverse and T time in the vertical direction represents the time of the events in their migrated positions. Remember, stacking velocities are estimated at events in their unmigrated positions, whereas RMS velocities are estimated at event for events in their migrated positions. The two velocities are different. Never should you use stacking velocities to migrate your data. It's the wrong thing to do. Okay, now, you take this migration volume, you have essentially transformed uh, midpoint offset time coordinates, transform the data from midpoint offset time to VRMS uh, line axis time of events in their migrated positions. Now you take each of the panels, image panels from within this migration volume and unmigrate them. We usually use the term demigration. We demigrate these image panels using the same velocities that we use to migrate the data. So we obtain a demigration volume. Now, the motivation to obtain this demigration volume is to sum over the velocity axis, demigration velocity axis, okay? and uh, synthesize a zero offset wave field because each panel in the demigration volume is a representation of a zero offset wave field. It's a replica of a zero offset wave field, except that each replica contains different events with different velocities, you see? So by doing a weighted summation along the velocity axis, we can synthesize a zero offset wave field. Thereby, we can capture all the steeply dipping events as well as diffractions, obtain a zero offset wave field. Then we return to the migration volume, pick RMS velocities as we described earlier from the semblance spectra, construct an RMS velocity field, and uh, perform time migration, zero offset time migration of the zero offset wave field to obtain the final image. Well, let's see how this compares with pre-stack time migration, okay? So this is the, uh, uh, the, the weighted summation of the demigration volume panels to obtain the synthesized zero offset wave field. Please pay attention to the uh, label on top. This is the uh, synthesized zero offset wave field. You can see that right in the middle where we have complex structure, we have lots of reflections and diffractions that we did not see before, you see. Now, all I have to do is perform post-stack or zero offset time migration to get the um, final image. Let's compare this with pre-stack time migration you can see that there's a huge difference. The reason is that with the velocity uncertainty that we had, uh, pre-stack time migration uh, failed right in the middle where we had the complex structure. Whereas because I was able to capture all the diffractions and steeply dipping events by synthesizing a zero offset wave field, I can simply migrate them and get a better image of the complex structure. All right. So now let's go back to the uh, to the uh, time migration of the zero offset wave field, and we ask the question: 
Can we improve upon this image? Well, all we have to do is take that image, uh, time migration of the synthesized zero offset wave field, and embed it or insert it into the migration volume. As you see here, this is the same section as this one right here, the time migrated zero offset wave field into the migration cube. And instead of using the constant velocity image panels from the migration volume, I'm going to use this uh, time migrated zero of synthesized zero set wave field to pick horizons as if I am a structural interpreter. Okay. And for each horizon, I extract a horizon consistent semblance spectrum that you see at the bottom. This is for one horizon, okay? So I pair up the horizon that I picked from the time migrated synthesized zero offset wave field here with the velocity strand that you see at the bottom. And I do this for each of the horizons that I picked so that I can obtain a structurally consistent and laterally consistent RMS velocity field. All right, so then I go back to my uh, zero offset uh, or synthesized zero offset wave field and use that updated RMS velocity field to obtain this image, updated image. Compared with the original image, there is not really much of a difference. What does this tell you? This tells you that the IQ workflow for imaging complex structures is very robust. You don't really, really need to do any velocity updating. The image that you would get from the IQ workflow can be declared as the final image. Okay, now here's the pre stack time migration using the updated velocities. Again, no matter how much you update, you still have a poor image in the middle from pre stack time migration compared to the time migration of the zero offset wave field, all right? Now let's move on to the depth domain. Move on to the depth domain. I take my synthesized zero offset wave field that you see here. I then take my RMS velocity field and perform disk conversion to obtain an interval velocity field and then use that interval velocity field to perform zero offset depth migration of the synthesized zero offset wave field, as you see here. I didn't have to do pre stack depth migration, you see. Now, <clears throat> this is a depth image, whereas this is a time image, depth image, timed image. Now, because I use Dick's conversion of, of RMS velocities, Invariably, I will have some velocity errors, of course. Dix conversion is based on horizontal layered earth assumption. So it's not a very exact interval velocity field. So this depth image is an auxiliary image, whereas I use time image as a principal image for doing structural interpretation, you see. In very complex structures, especially complex overburden structures that you see here. See, this zone here acts as a complex overburden for the structure below. In areas with complex overburden structures, building a velocity depth model for doing pre-stack depth migration can be very, very perilous, can be very time consuming. Um, and you may still not be able to get the uh, velocity depth model that you need to obtain an accurate, acceptable image in time, in depth. Therefore, we must be robust and only consider uh, a depth image that, is a, that, is, that can be declared as, as uh, auxiliary image compared to the image in time. This is the end of our presentation. So the IQ workflow is a way to circumvent 
the velocity uncertainty in areas with complex structures. Whereas the ISTATS workflow is, uh, a, is a way to estimate a near surface model that is equivalent medium model to calculate the shunt receiver statics without having to pick first breaks as required by travel time tomography, nor uh, without having to do wave field modeling as required by full wave inversion. Thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry that we had a lot of disruption from the, uh, from the conversations, but I think we managed to finish it on time. So I can, we can have some discussions. If, you, if people can send some questions um, and then you pass me those questions in the chat room, chat room, let me get out of the, uh, get out of the share screen and let's go to chat room. Um, and uh, Yes, sir. The chat box is right now disabled. Uh, we are opening it for the questions. All right. So let's let's just a minute. Uh, meanwhile, if anybody has a question, please switch on your mic and uh, yeah, ask the question. Or just write the question, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, please write the question in the chat box. How to compute the near surface CVS model? I am assuming that the, this is the question related to to generating the uh, the migration volume to pick the ref reflector associated with the base of the near, near surface. Well, as we showed in the presentation, you perform pre-stack depth migration using a range of constant velocities associated with the near surface region, yeah, low velocities, and uh, down to a depth that includes the near surface region only. So pre-stack depth migration uh, might actually scare you, but it is only for the very shallow portion of the subsurface, that is the near surface region. And then you pick the horizon from that image volume and the corresponding horizon consistent uh, velocity from that image volume. Why is better than TOMO for status corrections? Well, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, you don't have to pick first breaks. It doesn't require any first break picking. And first break picking can be very tedious if you have very, very complex near surface, very poor quality data with first breaks that are not easy to pick. Auto picking algorithms fail. Today, people are trying to use the machine learning algorithms, but I haven't seen anything successful. So it's very time consuming stage in travel time tomography, picking first breaks. Travel time tomography itself is not very time consuming at all. And uh, the other reason is that travel time tomography fails to resolve the velocity reversal associated with a hidden layer with high velocity in the near surface region, embedded within the uh, low velocities of the near surface, all right? Can IQ workflow also take care of anisotropy? Why don't I leave it to a young scientist to take care of that problem? Why we use this software, why not other? Is it really good software for shallow subsurface correction? Characteristics of the software Okay, well, again, I, uh, as I said, the ISTATS workflow doesn't require first break picking. It doesn't require um, wave field modeling as would be required by full wave inversion. 
it's not time consuming at all. Instead of finishing uh, your near surface modeling in a day or two or three, depending on whether you use travel time tomography or cool wave immersion, you just finish it in an hour or two. What else? Thank you, for, uh, sir. Your voice not clear. Why is that? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Voice is clear. Sir, there is another question, which is, which software is used? And please provide theory part of the lecture. OK, this will be available in the book that will be published by SCG this coming May. You can also find uh, 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 related papers in the leading edge in 2016, 18, I think. Uh, so there, there are some papers available, uh, both on iStats and iCube. OK, sir. So there is another question. Can forward modeling of FWI benefit from iCube method? No, because the iCube method does not yield a physically plausible model for the near surface. It only yields an equivalent medium model where the velocities are constant vertically within the near surface region between the floating datum and the intermediate datum, but laterally varying. Whereas the FWI requires a physically plausible model of the near surface, you see? That's a good question whoever asked it. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, I can see some more questions here. Uh, my, data uh, my data is shallow yes. to deeper and the multiples merge with some primers and deeper data, no problem to remove the multiples, the, any method to remove multiples. Of course, the multiples are not really the subject of, of this presentation. Um, if you're referring to a multiple problem for land data, uh, let me make two remarks. Uh, what's the most important and the most challenging problem for marine seismic? It's the multiples, right? Uh, to suppress multiples is, is probably the biggest problem in marine seismic data because the water bottom is rise to a strong velocity contrast. As a result, you end up with lots of water bottom related multiples, surface multiples, uh, peg leg multiples, intrabed, interbed multiples, etc. Whereas land seismic doesn't suffer all that much with uh, multiple from multiples, except in areas like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and few other parts of the world where we would have multiples that have the similar behavior as the multiples that we see in marine data. Unfortunately, removing multiples uh, with, uh, with velocities that are very close to the primary velocities is not easy, is not straightforward. In the book, I will, uh, I have a case study from Kuwait where I describe this problem. It's not an easy problem. The only way to recognize or identify multiples in such data, land data, is by well logged data, well information. That's the only way. Okay. Severe intrabed and intrabed multiples with velocities that are similar to the primary velocities. Another point I should, uh, should make is this. Don't think that multiple velocities are always lower than primary velocities. You could have multiples with velocities higher than some of the primaries, you see? Some of the primary velocities. So that's not easy, right? That's not easy. So this, this is a problem that is awaiting the young scientists to resolve. We are too old to resolve it now. Yes, sir. So there is another question. Once data is collected, but we need high resolution profile, what we have to do in processing? 
Once data is collected, what we need, the high resolution profile, what we have to do in process. The, this, this question calls for the following statement. If you don't have, if you don't have the frequencies in your recorded data, you cannot create those frequencies during processing. You cannot create something from nothing. There is no free lunch. If you have the signal in your data, the job of processing is to recover that signal uh, from the noise. You follow me? Uh, but if you don't have the signal with the required bandwidth in your data, in your recorded data, don't expect that you will create some frequencies that did not exist in your uh, in your recorded data. Now, the way to preserve the recorded bandwidth, signal bandwidth, is by applying an appropriate processing sequence that would include, for example, time varying spectral whitening to account for the non-stationarity of the signal and thereby also preparing it for predictive deconvolution so that the resulting spectrum of the processed shot gather would have a peak that is at a higher frequency, the dominant frequency of the signal compared to the dominant frequency in the recorded data associated with, say, surface waves. The most difficult problem in land seismic is attenuation or suppression of surface waves and guided waves as in contrast with marine data where the biggest problem is multiples. What else to say? Was any one problem not meant? Pre-solved problems. Um, uh, this is not a, the ice state is not for subsurface imaging. It's for, it's for near surface modeling, okay? It's for near surface modeling. Don't get it confused with the subsurface imaging. Um, uh, what please. else do we have here? We got a few more minutes, so let me okay, take. Sir. If we compute status by ISTAT method, can I use floating datum instead of flat datum? The floating datum in the ISTATs, remember, is not the same floating datum. Sorry. Sorry, the question is, if we compute statics by ISTAS method, can I use floating data instead of flat data? Uh, you don't use flat data when doing travel time tomography. You ray trace from the, from the topography through the near surface model. So the flat data comes right after migration. You have to do the status corrections from the topography down to the engineering datum and back up to the floating datum. You might estimate your RMS velocities from the floating datum and you migrate from the floating datum. Then you redatum your image that you obtain from migration to a flat datum just above the floating datum. That's the last step you would do in order to submit the result to your client. You never estimate your RMS velocities, nor perform migration from a flat data. That's wrong. That's wrong for land data. You have to do it from floating data. Yes, sir. So I think uh, we can proceed to the valedictory session and the rest of the questions uh, we will see in the emails. Okay. Videos. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, sir. Well, for the valedictory session, uh, first of all, I would request uh, Professor M. K. Shrivastava, uh, our faculty advisor at SEG BHU student chapter, to address the audience. Uh, sir, please, if you are there, please. Yeah, thank you, Viru.
Uh, and thanks, uh, uh, Professor Ilmaz, for his uh, very elaborative, very informative lecture. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, time. Thank you, and... Thank you very much for your. Are you? Are you? Can you? Can you? Can you hear me? Sure. Yes, Thank sir. you very yes, much. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. I wish you. I wish you all the best in your studies. Thank you. Definitely, yes, sir. Uh, these uh, young uh, persons from uh, this department and all around uh, India and the rest of the part of the world who have listened to your, you have heard your witness you uh, your lecture. Uh, they must be encouraged to do many things in uh, uh, interpretation processing as well as for in the development of new instrumentation required for that. Definitely, yeah. yes. Uh, that was really, I mean, they must be waiting for your, uh, this uh, uh, book, a new book to be launched soon so that they can, they can okay. get and get encouraged with the, with the new information. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I must uh, thank you, the team also, particularly some of the persons who were very active and very uh, collaborative with, uh, uh, for their uh, help in arranging your lecture, sir. Uh, I must I must mention uh, Dr. Uh, the name of Dr. Nimisha Vedanti uh, from NGRI, uh, Professor uh, Lalit Kumar Mattu uh, from uh, SM High Tech, uh, Professor Partha Mitra for uh, uh, from IIT Kharagpur, Dr. V M Tiwari, Director NGRI, and his team, all our team for arranging uh, very good, uh, very elaborative lectures. Uh, apart from that, I must thank a few more persons uh, like uh, Pawan Kumar Singh from I Oil India Limited and all uh, of the, the team from this SEG student team who, who did uh, splendid work for, your, uh, for this lecture. Thank you all. And uh, definitely all, all of them are waiting for your book to come and uh, so that they can be enlightened more. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I wish you the best. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, these questions definitely would reach to you by email if uh, uh, sure. some of them definitely need some, some uh, answers. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye-bye now. Bye -bye. Thank you Thank all you. for participation. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request uh, President SEG Student Chapter BHU to address the audience. Uh, thank you, Viru. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening to all. On the behalf of SEG Boston chapter from Azerbaijan, I would like to uh, give thanks to our distinguished lecturer, uh, Dr. Öz Yilmaz, for enlightening us in a giving topic. And also, I would like to uh, give my special thanks to a uh, chapter uh, for contributing to, uh, to realizing this event. SEG Panaras Indus University and SEG National uh, Geophysical Research Institute for their effort and contribution. And finally, I would like to thank all the participants who uh, allowed their time to participate in this uh, great webinar. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Ramit. Thank you. And uh, now I request President SEG Student Chapter BHU to address the audience. Thank you, Guru. My greetings to everyone. I am Satrugan, President of SAG BHU Student Chapter. I would like to extend my warm wishes and regards to the speaker, one and only Dr. Oja Dilmar. Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. We learned a lot from this. I would, I, I would like to thank Dr. Lalit Kumar Mattu, Director SN High Tech Private Limited, and Dr. Partha Pimitra, Professor IIT Kharagpur, for their contribution in arranging this lecture and convincing Dr. Ilmaj for the same. Next, I would like to thank our distinguished alumnus, Dr. Nimisa Vedanti, Senior Principal Scientist of NGRI, for her efforts in contacting Professor Mattu and motivating us to organize this lecture with Dr. Ilmaj. I would like to thank Dr. V. M. Tiwari, Director NGRI, and our beloved professor and faculty advisor, Professor Manoj Kumar Srivastava, for his kind support and helping us out to collaborate with NDRI. I would, next, I would like to thank SAG Bose student chapter, Azerbaijan, NGRI, 
NGRI Geophysical Society for collaborating with us. At last, I would like to thank all the participants and team members <clears throat> without whom the seminar would not have been possible. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shatru. Uh, now I request uh, President SED Student Chapter NGRI to address the audience. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, uh, Aditya Mohanty, is President of SED Student Chapter NGRI. So thank you so much, sir. It's a privilege. I'd like to thank you, sir, for uh, finding your time and giving this lecture. This was highly informative and it's our privilege to hear from you, to hear such an informative lecture. Thank you so much, sir for being so patient and I would, like to, uh, I would like to thank you for that. And at the same time, I would like to thank SEG BHU student chapter and SEG uh, both student chapter of Azerbaijan. And I would also like to thank you, our director of NGRI, Dr. B.M. Tiwari and Nimisha ma'am at the same time and VPK Patro sir for helping us to collaborate with the student chapter of BHU and Rose and then finally, leading to this successful lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the participants also. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aditya. Uh, OK, so uh, and now uh, I want to uh, uh, invite President SEG student chapter IIT Ruki. They helped us increase our audience. Thank you, Viru. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our guest of honor, Dr. Ozi Ilmaz, for giving his valuable time to the next generation of geophysicists. We're grateful to learn from such a world-renowned person in the field of geophysics and geosciences. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'd also like to thank SCG Student Chapter BHU, SCG Student Chapter BOSS, and NGRI Geophysical Society for giving us this wonderful opportunity to learn from and interact with Dr. Ilmaz. I'd also like to thank all the students and staff involved in the back end of this successful special talk. IIT Roorkee SEG student chapter would like to express its gratitude for being given an opportunity to be a part of this amazing event. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. We are very grateful to you. Uh, this okay. was a really informative lecture and uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. All the best. <laughs>